Invading the internet covering web 2.0, coast to coast, worldwide, and everywhere in between. This is where you put the social in social media. We are Social Blade. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 38 of the Social Blade Show. I'm Jason Ergo. I'm Erin Ryan. And I'm Victor Barrera. And joined with us today is special guest Ritu Pent uh, from, among other things, my Environmental Graffiti. Thanks for joining us today, Ritu. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so, awesome. so for the rest of us here, uh, how, how have you guys been doing? Anything uh, interesting going Fabulous. on recently? <laughs> yeah, things have been good, Great. man. Well, good to hear. Good to hear. Yeah, myself actually. I, I've been traveling a bit. I, I was away this past weekend, uh, so did a bunch of driving from here to North uh, New York, New Boston, New Jersey, right? Back. No, nah, New Jersey, like Sweet. right by New York City. So, what were we doing up in Boston? No, no, not Boston. Uh, New Jersey. Not Boston. Right, right. Yeah, what were we doing in New Jersey? City. <laughs> uh, a friend of mine, actually, uh, the person who you know, I go by Ergo online. Um, the friend of mine who uh, helped come up with the name Ergo got married this past weekend. So, that, that oh, was nice. Cool. Can you give us That's a brief, a brief description of how someone comes up with the name Ergo? Just for How? the rest of us. <laughs> sure. Uh, Ergo was originally uh, decided. Um, I, I was probably like, uh, I don't know, 14, something like that, uh, at my friend's house and needed a name for a online game. Uh, it was a game based off of Lord of the Rings and uh, just were coming up with names. And uh, Ergo was the one that stuck and just have used it ever since. <laughs> nice nice that. that you know funny story similar situation happened in my name my parents were playing pong and <laughs> you know they each had to enter profile names so they're like oh well victor works you know, <laughs> seriously <laughs> no nah, i'm just kidding really, oh. but that's that'd be a good story though wouldn't it that would yeah you should have stuck with it well <laughs> yeah, no, yeah my my yeah my name no 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 it doesn't really work like that <laughs> i'm glad my parents sat down i'm like all right let's think about a name instead of just Oh well, that one looks good. Let's, let's give him that one. You know. Yeah. I mean, it would simplify things, but hey, what can you do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As Matt was saying, uh, who names their kid Ergo? No, I, my Jason's my real name. So, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> another place um, that uh, I go by Ergo, and um, it's kind of my brand name, but uh, it's not a business at all. But uh, a lot of people use it for businesses. Is YouTube. Um, and, uh, there's, you know, when you go to it, it's a video site, you, you can do a lot of things with it. And a lot of businesses are using it to help promote, uh, what they're doing, be it, uh, making baskets or selling cars or doing whatever. There's, there's a hundred different things you can do with it more than that. But, uh, it, it actually, if you use a few simple tips, uh, you know, follow a few simple guidelines here, you can make your experience with it a whole lot better. Um, the first one is do create and customize your channel. Basically when you create your account there, you just got this generic channel there. Uh, if you have any branding, you know, a background or something, put that up, make it look more appealing to people visiting there. So it doesn't just look basic. Add subtitles with the new YouTube, uh, changes that they did about a month ago. Uh, you can actually automatically have YouTube create subtitles and that just makes it uh, reach out to a whole lot more people that, uh, you know, are hearing impaired. Uh, next thing, don't overuse annotations. Uh, annotations are those little pop-up things you can put on the videos and they look kind of cool when you play around with them at first, but it makes your page look all my spacey if you're using too many of those. So definitely don't overuse them. Do act to remove offensive comments. Uh, comments on the page, uh, you know, don't remove all of them, but if you're having people swearing on the page there or just trolling it, uh, you don't want people visiting the page to see those, and, and it's better to remove those. However, as we've talked about on, on previous shows here, if you're just getting a negative or critical comment about your product, it's better to respond to it uh, constructively rather than just removing that. Do engage with the YouTube community. What this means is a whole bunch of things. Um, 
the, what I personally think on this is first off, respond to comments. Uh, you might get a hundred comments on your video. Uh, you might get a lot less, uh, but do respond to them, interact with the community, make it seem like, um, you know, there's someone there. You're not just you, there. The viewers not just uh, watching and you're not just broadcasting to no one. Organize your content. If you're uploading a video every day, uh, you might want to organize things into playlists to make things more accessible to people. Don't overlook tags. Uh, anyone that ever has done anything with SEO to improve your ranking on Google will know about keywords. Tags are basically the same thing as that just with videos. So you can add tags to your video that categorize it and when people search, it, it'll make it pop up. Do promote your videos, uh, your YouTube videos elsewhere. Don't just think that people will just find your channel by searching on YouTube. If you have a blog or you know, your company website, uh, make sure you embed the videos there. If you have a Twitter account, share your videos on Twitter or in Facebook. Uh, just don't let them just sit there. Uh, you do use YouTube's free analytics tools. YouTube has a lot of great, great, great insight tools that I. Uh, you can uh, see what videos are being watched, where people are discovering them from, and, and also inside each video, if it gets enough views, you can actually see, compared to videos of similar lengths, if people are tuning out like halfway through. So it could help you to create better content and keep people engaged. And lastly, don't neglect your channel. There are so many channels uh, on YouTube now, and if you start getting people to watch your videos there, you, you don't want to just have a, a null period where there's nothing there for an extended period of time. People will just forget about it and uh, basically won't watch your videos anymore. So what do you, what do you guys think? Uh, anyone have any experience uh, from a company's perspective with YouTube or um, you know, anyone? You know, not, not really. Like, I mean, I know YouTube and kind of how it kind of plays its role within the whole scheme of basic, you know, the basic online marketing kind of toolkit, if you will. Um, but in terms of working with companies who have specifically, you know, used YouTube as a platform for marketing their product and or service, I mean, you know, I think a lot, mainly uh, application developers and startups, like this is a great way to, you know, give people product previews like, um, you, you know, Mint, like before Mint launched, you know, they, they had their YouTube channel and that was like a big part of like what was coming up and, uh, you know, I, I have more experience kind of promoting these things, but not necessarily from a, uh, from a big business or small business perspective, more like just the media perspective, you know what I mean? Like it's a lot easier to just um, promote and spread around something that's genuinely funny or genuinely cool uh, than it is to like be like, okay, here's a preview of the next Seismic Twitter app, you know, it's just, it's not all that exciting, uh, I feel. You know, as a medium, like I'd rather do something more interactive, uh, like an online, you know, test of the actual thing. I think from a, um, a business perspective for small businesses, YouTube is a wonderful place to not only share your business from the location it's at and to potential clients that live close by or live a little bit further away and can't see what's going on at your dealership as often as they'd like. It's a way, you know, I think it's a way to to keep whether it's a dealership, whether it's a business, whatever place you're coming from in regards to your business, it's a place where you can open, I guess, have an open door for people to see inside without them actually having to leave their house. So I think that's what's great about YouTube. I loved the point that you had there, Jason, um, with the 10 tips, because it's true. Even though they have cool tools like the annotations for you to use, overdoing anything mm -hmm. sucks. Oh, absolutely. So... Yeah, so just keep a, an eye out for that. Um, speaking about things that are changing and how to keep your, your, I guess, social look more social instead of having it uh, cluttered up and, and people not wanting to watch it. Well, this week, the F8 conference took place. And we're trying to figure out here, do we like all this liking that's going on? Um, as we've covered in the weeks prior to Facebook's F8 conference that took place this week on um, April 21st and confirmed that they will in fact be implementing new and social ways for you to share what you love on the internet directly to your Facebook feed. 
Firstly, they want to give the user the ability to share what they like with the example from the website IMDb. When you click on a movie title, you will then see a like button. We tested this out last night and it's kind of cool. Much like the one that they have now seen integrated into pages instead of the become a fan button that was its predecessor. This has stirred some chatter and a lot of the feedback received has not been so positive. The page owner's perspective seems to be glum as well as some of the users. However, Facebook's look on it is that they're, they're trying to separate the wall between having page owners higher up than their previous named fans. Instead, they want us all to be on equal footing, which is still something for you to decide whether you like or not. Now, we're going to have a poll up in the corner. You know, Aaron? Um, whether, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I just want to say, in, in relationship to, to the whole, you know, switching from a fanning something to liking something, um, there's this picture that a lot of people would have probably seen in the past month or so. But basically, it just really pokes fun at the fact that um, you know, you can join Facebook and you can become a fan, you know, and I, I think that that created a somewhat interesting, uh, you know, relationship in terms of relating Facebook users to, let's say, their favorite publication like Wired or something. You know, I, I think that the whole liking it puts it in a uh, clear perspective. And, you know, I, I think that it really makes it easier for someone to go to, let's say, a, a publication or an online offering that maybe they're not like, you know, the biggest fan of, but maybe they really like that iteration or that piece of content. You know, you can like it, but not necessarily like admit that, oh man, you're you're a fan of, you know, maybe some blog that you really just don't like. Like for instance with me, it'd be XKCD. I can't stand XKCD, but maybe their next comic is really good and I may like it on Facebook. And you know, yeah. I don't have to give up that, you know, I'm a fanatic or a fan of uh, this web comic that I really loathe, um, but that iteration of it was pretty awesome. You know, no, you're absolutely right. I agree there. with you. My yeah. personal opinion about it is that, you know, we uh, if you look at our Facebook page, um, uh, Joshua Denny and Joel Mackey were, were talking a lot about it, and it was on, on a negative level, which I can see their point. And if you go there and you, and you have a look at it, you'll be able to understand what they're talking about, too. But from my perspective, I see it as it brings it a more social aspect. It's not about celebrities and groupies. It's about, okay, we are all like, we either like the same things or we don't. And I understand, you know, from certain business aspects, they want the become a fan button. They don't want the like button because to them, it's like devaluing their page. When in fact, in my opinion, it's, it's keeping it more social. And I think that's what Facebook is really trying to aim for. So as I was saying, like, uh, Ergo's going to have a poll up. Um, it's going to ask you, do you think changing the page button was a good idea? Let us know what while well, you think. Now, while you, what you think, while you take a few seconds to answer the poll, I will get back to the IMDb. So, once clicking the like button under the movie title you've chosen, it will then automatically be added to your Facebook profile and newsfeed for your friends to see. You are supposed to also be able to see the direct location in which you clicked the like button when hovering over its link. This is called the social plugin, which you can add to your site with a simple line of HTML or XFBML, Facebook markup language, tags to let publishers port Facebook's social graph to their website. So you can add the like button to your website and the FacePile, loving this plugin name, FacePile, will show which of your friends have joined as well. So once you click the like button on the website, if any of your friends from Facebook has clicked the like button as well from that website, you'll see a little face or their profile picture show up right underneath that like on that website so you guys are liking the like action that's going on i, I think it makes more sense than becoming a fan <laughs> oh absolutely no uh, like here this is the perfect example here we were playing around with this last night uh, it's so new so you don't really know for sure how it's uh well I, you can't see a good representation of it but look at this here uh the movie kick ass so if i was trying to see you know if i thought i was going to like it you've always had imdb uh where you could see you know how many stars it's rated by everyone but now i, I can also go here and see oh look uh my friends jeff aaron and victor are both are all like it as well and so do 1251 other people on facebook so it's just really another great way to um, get recommendations about things, I think. I absolutely love the like 
button. <laughs> and uh, beyond that, we actually even added it on the Social Blade page here. So at the bottom of every story on Social Blade, uh, we got the same like button right there. So. Very nice, Ergo. Very nice on the uh, quick implementation of the latest Facebook Absolutely. features to integrate with the blog. Absolutely. And There's another and way stuff. to get your website socialize, socializing with Facebook, which I'm sure we're going to be doing as well. It's called Open Graph Protocols. And what is it? Well, by inputting the Open Graph Protocols, which with the information that is provided by the website owner, the website will become a part of the social graph on Facebook. The users will be able to connect your pages. Your pages will show up in their profiles within search results and in news feeds. So no matter what type of website, as soon as the like button is clicked, it becomes an object to the user on Facebook. You also gain the lasting capabilities of Facebook pages, a link from the user's profile, ability to publish to the user's news feed, and as well as the inclusion in search on Facebook. And of course, the analytics through Facebook's revamped Insights product. This is meant to help the website owner connect to their visitor on a more social level, which Facebook thinks will be better for business and create a more relevant experience. What are our thoughts on the open graph protocols? It's, uh, uh, well, in my opinion, in my opinion, all they've really done now with these, uh, at least from what I've seen, is they finally added an API similar to what other sites have, uh, Twitter, for example. Uh, but they've taken it and they, they added everything related to Facebook as well. Uh, so I, I think it's a great idea. You know, now the, everyone's going to be able to develop a lot more rather than just making apps on the site. They can do <laughs> similar things to what we're doing on Twitter right now, where uh, you can expand the functionality of the site there and do a lot more. So it, I, I'm, I think it's a great idea. And I think we're going to see a lot more innovation now uh, with this here. So so for the end user, though, like let's say for someone like me who is just a content consumer, you know, I use Facebook for mostly personal and entertainment mm -hmm. related purposes, um, but I'm not trying to promote my business or promote my website on Facebook. Uh, what does this mean for me, like the end Facebook user, like in terms of my experience? Uh, for the end user at the moment, not too much. I, but I, I mean, Facebook sort of with the, the tools that we were talking about here, the like button, for example, that's just one mm -hmm. thing that can be done with this functionality here. So really now cool. that they've just released all of this, it's in the hands of developers. So, you know, Twitter has its own API and people have built all sorts of different apps on there, voting things, uh, picture things. I, I don't know. It, totally numerous things and Twitter's API is much, much, much more limited compared to what you can do with Facebook's one. So really, oh, again, okay. it's in the hands of developers right now. I can't really answer that question per se. Uh, check back in a month uh, or even in a couple of weeks and you probably see a lot, uh, a lot more built on it. And yeah, it's the, well, uh, I, I, I can, I can open that up a little bit. I can open that up. Well, first, before, before we get into the, the open graph part of it, but, how was the first? I hope everybody had a chance to vote with the poll. Yeah. What uh, were the results? Or yeah. no? So the question we asked was, do you think that changing the page button was a good, oh, it looks like it cut it off, but good idea is what it was supposed to be. And the uh, choices were, I like it and I'm not a fan. Mm -hmm. We, uh, the results of the poll were 80% of the people like it and only 20% are not good. a fan. Good news for Facebook. Well, we're going to have another poll coming up. So just like they were talking about um, the, 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 the um, graph API, this week during the F8, Facebook did explain a little bit more about their open graph um, API. It used to just be graph API, but what they've done is they have um, made it more powerful and simpler, um, and it's going to be assessed on the URLs. This will allow website owners to search over people, events, and so on, including public and personal streams. The graph is ever-changing to keep up with the real-time information. Right now, more than 75 sites have launched these new features and will service more than 1 billion like buttons. Facebook has also announced special partnerships with Microsoft, Pandora and Yelp in order to build experiences where people can seamlessly transition between Facebook and other services. 
Overall, they want you to connect easier across the web while Facebook remains your hub. So the second poll we need here is, will you be adding any of these features to your business? We want to know if, if you have a website, would you would you be adding it to your business's website, to um, your client's website? Are you going to be adding it? So Erga's going to have that poll up there for you. Be sure to vote. Okay, so this is a quote from Mark Zuckerberg. Quote, we're building toward a web where the default is social. I'm really liking that. Zuckerberg said, every application and product will be designed from the ground up to use real identity and friends. End quote. So overall, do we think this will be uh, a way to open up the web to be more social? Or is it a way for Mark Zuckerberg to keep people on Facebook? Um, it's interesting because, I, I, you know, I paid some attention to the conference in the sense of some of the bigger announcements. And I get the impression that Facebook is trying to kind of expand the net that they're casting um, to give people an incentive to, you know, basically integrate, you know, their website with what's happening on Facebook. I mean, if you can make a seamless connection between your your business, your product, your publication, and, and Facebook and make it as seamless as possible to integrate your Facebook identity into things like commenting, liking, without even really having to log in again and stuff. I mean, just small things like that, that kind of streamline the kind of social process, if you will, um, can pay off dividends for Facebook. I mean, if you turn them uh, into even a, a better publisher's uh, friend, you know, in the sense of make it easier to integrate and, you know, helping kind of facilitate the trend, you know, the, the movement of traffic from, you know, and from people from Facebook to your publication. Um, if you make that easier than ever, I mean, I can see this as kind of a win-win. You know, Facebook gets more potential uh, users, uh, you know, bouncing back to and from these publishers to Facebook, and the publishers obviously will benefit from that as well. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think, you know, it, it's smart. In my opinion, uh, Mark is gonna is gonna use it as let's let's have the default being social on the web, which mm -hmm. to me that's great. You know that is what we're all demanding. We want a more social aspect, not just from our networks, but from the internet. So for him to implement the web onto his social network, that's a smart move for a business aspect. It's it's bringing it's bringing the traffic to Facebook, but that's where people want to be anyways. So I think making that that transition and that move to to incorporate themselves onto the websites out there, especially IMDb to start off with, that's mm -hmm. that's a smart move. Yeah. So totally. And you know, I, IMDb has a lot to gain from it in the sense of, you know, being the official. Do you like this movie? You know, and they're really going gung ho in terms of you know the placement of these Facebook like situations. You know, making them visible, making them. A uh, integral part of the quote unquote, um, you know, publication social network linked experience. I mean, I'm noticing on Mashable that, you know, every article has one of those Facebook like buttons. I mean, it just seems like more and more, they're all roads from a publication, from a business, uh, from a product perspective seem to lead to Facebook. And, uh, you know, I, I think the jury's still out as to whether that's a good thing. Obviously, the whole privacy, numerous privacy fiascos on Facebook part within the past year, year and a half have, have done a lot to, you know, make people carefully uh, tread upon, you know, what it is that they're, they're doing on Facebook and how much information they're actually going to, you know, be, uh, be uh, making public. And, um, you know, uh, what this is doing is this is kind of, you know, it's kind of digging that hole. Not that necessarily this is a hole, um, but we're f further enmeshing ourselves within how much we're relying on Facebook, um, not just to interact with our friends and our family, uh, but with our favorite phone publications, with our favorite spots to hang out with on the web. And I'm not sure, um, you know, opening up the uh, floodgates and interlinking everyone and everything from a publication perspective or website perspective, I'm not sure if that's good for the web. I'm not sure if there's any one social network that needs to be that hub because the beauty of social networks is that there's numerous ones. I know people have their favorites and they, you know, they have their preferences. Um, but ultimately, I, I like the option of having Facebook, but then, you know, being on my favorite sites, not having to feel like I'm in Facebook, you know, like I, I think there's a lot of value to being able to have separate spheres between what's happening on the social web and what's happening on the quote unquote kind of static web, although they're most certainly linked. I just don't think that they have to eventually become one and the same, you know, where do you draw the line between uh, something that is not social and something that inherently is, you know? 
Completely agree. Let's see what the audience has to say. Ergo, do we have the results for the poll? We do. Uh, again, the question was, will we be adding these new features, the, like the like button and other ones, to your website? 75% of the respondents said yes, and 25% uh, said not sure. Hmm. You're not sure. Not sure, huh? So, Why wouldn't they be sure? I mean, I, I guess, yeah. People can be sitting on the fence. This is all very new stuff. I mean, unless you're a developer or a business who's super gung ho about finding out what's you know what's the next step for integrating Facebook with your product and or service, um, it, it may not be totally relevant. Like I said, to to the end consumer, aka me. Um, but it's all really interesting stuff. I mean, where they're taking the API, you know, the future uh, and what it holds from an application perspective. Obviously, is very exciting stuff. But um, yeah. So it's, uh, it's 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 fun to ponder. Mm -hmm. So Victor, uh, speaking of being not sure, if you're not sure on where to get some computer parts, you, you just bought a new computer, right? Where, where do you go if you need some help with that? Uh, you know, it's interesting story ago. I actually did build myself a new computer, um, but it definitely could not have been possible without the uh, advice and expert uh, info from Dave Altavia and HotHardware.com. And as, as everybody here knows, HotHardware.com is um, our media sponsor who's been great, uh, you know, who's been very good to us in terms of uh, supporting us and helping us uh, keep doing our thing on the web. And a uh, big shout out to Dave as he helped me pick all my components. You know, he set me up with some good advice. I mean, I had some tough questions that I was Googling for and people at Tom's Hardware Forums weren't exactly being nice. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I just hit up Dave and he gave me the lowdown on everything I should know about, you know, from picking the right processor to, oh, you know, picking the parts around it, make sure I can overclock, uh, you name it. Um, so, you know, if you have any hardware questions, you know, you're, you're sitting on the fence about building yourself a new Core i7 PC, hit up hothardware.com. They got the motherboard reviews on, you know, they got the reviews on all the hottest tech and products. So, you know, keep up on that with hothardware.com. Thanks, Victor. Yeah, 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 it's all good, man. Definitely a good resource, no doubt. Yeah, so um, speaking uh, of sponsors and advertising, um, on websites, have you guys ever gone to a website and had to fill out one of those annoying little captures that you, you know you try to post a comment oh my gosh. on or you try yeah you try to log in too many times I you're trying to buy a ticket I can't stand those things yeah. um I, I don't know what kind of I mean I know there's different versions and different types of captures and you know depending on what site and what you're trying to do, the captcha is either very easy to read or impossible to read, yeah. and that's what I dislike about them. Is I, which, I've been pwned by some captcha in my day, and it's been horrible. Right, which, specifically for me. Yeah, it was some of the ones that I hate the most. Some sites they're not too bad, but uh, I do a lot of commenting on YouTube, and uh, the YouTube ones are just absolutely horrible. Uh, you know, yeah. it, it's the same ones that Google uses for everything. Uh, now, what would you guys think if instead of just having normal captures that instead if the captures were actually advertisements there's a what do you mean do you do you mean like a, an impossible logo to identify like a pepsi logo that's just all skewed up not, i mean what's not, not exactly uh, like that if you if you get, if you look on the screen right now i got an example of one there's a company uh, out of new york in philadelphia called ad copy that's just starting up here uh -huh. and they're working on advertisement captures so oh, no. This is just an huh. example. Uh, Dish Network, not a sponsor of Social Blade. Um, mm -hmm. They have an advertisement here where I guess $180 savings is one of their catchphrases, or you know, it's something that they want to tell you uh, about their product. So you actually mm -hmm. have to type in something related to that advertisement. So in there. this example, you'd be typing in $180 you know, savings, and then that would satisfy your captcha. That would be the captcha. So what? What? Uh, you know, the the hold on, but the the real cool thing about this, or at least from an advertising standpoint, um, is that, you know, when, if you actually have the customer type something in, it's, you know, in school when your teacher tells you to it's write an impression. something down. You're right. yeah. It's easier to it remember. It's described in, in their memory. Yeah, absolutely. Like if, I, like if I had the, you know, maybe let's say make a comment on YouTube and up came this ad captcha mm -hmm. and I had to type in $180 savings, I would be like, hmm, just network, $100 savings. I mean, I guess. But at the same time, is this 
is this more annoying than those I, impossible to determine captchas? I don't think I'm so. Sure. I would I would absolutely sure. prefer something like this. I can clearly yeah, I mean, see. This is definitely more simple. <laughs> like I would be like, doo, 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 you know, yeah. but it, it's better than the captcha where I have to try it out like five or six times and I'm like struggling to figure out what it yeah. is because I'm blind. You know, this is definitely much much simpler. Um, but I don't know. I can see people like. I mean, the last place you'd expect to, to get some ads served are your CAPTCHA pages. I mean, I guess this is kind of a, you know, it's kind of an open market in the sense of mm -hmm. there's not a lot of ad companies integrating uh, ad schemes in, in CAPTCHA design. But I'm not, you know, I'm not sure if that's where people need to be seeing ads. I mean, they're, they're usually trying to do something or accomplish something online. The last thing they need is to be annoyed by like, oh, oh man, not another Pepsi ad. You know? <laughs> but again, again, I... The, Captures are uh, a necessary evil on the web to stop spammers or bots and things like that. Uh, yeah, and why not you know, turn for, it in a way to make money? Hey, well, I, I agree. I, I honestly, I you know, I use ad block on sites, so I, I don't see most ads. But if there's something in there, I honestly, I don't think I'd have much of a problem with that. Uh, though it does, one of the uh, the captures that most people use um, is tr uh, translating books. So, we, you know, that, I guess, uh, will go down a little bit for transcribing them. Sorry, not translating. Um, so those people will lose out a little bit. But I honestly, I think it's a, a decent idea. And um, Yeah. I'd you like know, Ritu just said something in the room that's pretty insightful. And, you know, he thinks as long as it's done in good taste. And, mm -hmm. and I agree. Like, I think, like, let's say, you know, you're watching a the latest preview for the newest Google product. And you're going to make uh, a comment. And... It asks you for a captcha. I mean, if they if they use if they targeted the captcha marketing schemes to for specific yeah. uh, contexts and specific websites that were relevant and you know maybe even useful in some senses of the word, um, you know that could potentially be a great use. But if you're seeing teeth whitening on the captcha, <laughs> that's just going to be annoying as hell, you know. So yeah, I mean, if implemented in the correct manner, these things could really uh, be a refreshing way uh, to serve ads on on your site. Um, but, uh, but hey, you know, it's, it's an interesting idea. I mean, obviously there are marketers and people looking to, you know, th they're reassessing the whole, the totality of the web experience. And obviously someone felt that this was a void that needs to be filled, that somewhere their captcha is being served that could be making your company money. And that I understand. So I think it's kind of an inevitability at this point. It's just a matter of time before we see these things everywhere. Uh, yeah, I think Richie yeah. had something to say about it. Yeah, about the whole CAPTCHA thing, I think it's a brilliant idea. I mean, no matter where you go, when you're going on Facebook, uh, you're typing in these CAPTCHAs, I mean, half of them you can't even understand. So, I mean, <laughs> that was on the screen earlier, it says 180 savings. So, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, it's easy to type, and I mean, it gives, you all, you're only typing a certain amount of characters, but I mean, the whole business is getting a pretty good exposure, so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, totally. This could be a good way to uh, supplement the the rest of the running ad schemes on, let's say, a site like YouTube. I mean, this could be millions and millions of extra ads served a day. And the impression's there. I mean, you can't discount that as an impression because if someone has to type something in response to it, guaranteed impression. You know, Whereas in terms of the way they measure things like CPMs for, for normal ads that are run on sidebars and headers, you know, there's, there's a, a some disconnect there between how many times the ad was, was served and how many times the ad was actually seen. Oftentimes because, um, you know, people are using Adblock Plus, which I most certainly use, but I make sure to unlock uh, sites I actually like. And, and ergo, somewhere in a dark, dark corner <laughs> in the Northeast, Dave Altavia is crying tears because he used <laughs> Adblock Plus. Yeah, <laughs> which, by the way, I did just to get off topic just a little here. Uh, we didn't mention it earlier, but uh, JD is actually joining us here. He can't speak, but JD, if you can hear us, wave your arms around. Uh, he's uh, 35,000 feet or so above uh, the air currently, flying from Detroit back home. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that, that's him on the airplane. He's broadcasting from an airplane. He's like a president, you know, joining yeah. us from Air Force. <laughs> I, I'm wondering if he can hear us. His seat kind of looks he comfy. Might. I want to know how his experience is yeah. flying back. Uh, I, I don't know. Right. I don't know if you saw it there a minute ago, but it looked like also uh, the one of the flight attendants was crowded over the laptop. So I think he was explaining to them what he was doing. So, 
Very cool. <laughs> nice, nice. Technology these days is just amazing. You know, it, it is nice that you can get Wi-Fi on an airplane. I just wish they could make it so that it doesn't suck. Um, obviously, BAM was horrible because everybody who's logging on Wi-Fi on an airplane is just juicing it, you know, streaming media and stuff, and that's not very good. Um, but on to the, uh, on to the next topic. Um, you know, this week I, I was looking at, you know, a bunch of uh, headlines and social media stories to cover, and, and I saw something out of the corner of my eye in Mashable that I felt would be uh, good to talk about, and it has to do with social media strategy and multicultural consumers. Now, I know what you're thinking. Um, you know, you're probably thinking, all right, well, where are you really going with this? And, and the article was presented from a perspective of, like, here's eight tips, like eight you know, key things to keep in mind um, if you are doing any strategy of this type for a company that maybe has a great product, um, but they have, you know, a, a whole audience and, you know, an audience specifically that they may be trying to target. And in this sense, it would be multicultural consumers. And, and I think this is an important topic, uh, on a topic that's often, I think, just kind of brushed under the rug. I mean, usually when, you know, if you're working for, for American Airlines or Delta and, you know, it's your job to come up with the social media aspect of that marketing strategy, you know, what are you going to do to target, um, you know, lesser represented uh, demographics into the whole scheme of that marketing plan? And, and I think that the article makes some good points in the sense of recognizing that over 34% of the U.S. population in itself is of, um, you know, of a minority uh, descent, you know, and but if you if you look at the aggregation of the spending power though of that of that whole group of people though, um, it's well over two trillion dollars. Which, um, you know, if you're a marketer and you're assessing markets, especially within the context of the USA, um, these are numbers that cannot be ignored. Um, that no matter who you are, no matter how small of a scale or how large of a scale that your marketing strategy is, especially in the context of social media. Um, you have to keep in mind, you know, how can we best um, reach these consumers um, that, you know, maybe maybe are not totally representative of the average target demographic. I mean, if, if you're Nike um, or, or if you're the NBA or if you're the NFL, you know, for instance, what are you going to do to target a more Latino audience? And, and I think that this article had some really good points to present. And I could just go through them one by one and tell you, number one, you know, including multicultural in your larger marketing strategy. But I think that the essence of what it is that Mashable is presenting here, and specifically uh, Jessica Carter, who, who wrote the article, is that, you know, if, if you're doing any sort of strategy, any sort of so social media marketing, uh, you know, no matter how big or how small, um, that, you know, you can, you can really get a lot more out of the effort that you're spending if you go the extra lengths to understand the audience and uh, to understand that, you know, relating to a Latino customer is not the same way that you're going to relate to your Caucasian customer. You know, and I know it seems, I know this seems like common sense stuff, like, oh, well, you just got to adjust the way you market it. Well, I think that it's a little more intricate than that. You got to find a kind of common ground between your company, their product, their service, uh, whatever whatever it is that they're offering, and the you know the average Latino uh, you know person within that kind of demographic that you're aiming for in let's say Los Angeles, um, that you know you're really going to have to do your homework in terms of you know where pe these people spend their time online, you know what communities are they engaging with, are they niche communities, is it something like Que Pasa or MySpace Latino, or are they all over Dig or Facebook? I mean, you you have to be willing to scour. Um, the, the the complete uh, depth of of what social networking communities have to offer, which are sometimes uh, niche related. I mean, there's communities out there which target you know African American women, you know uh, Asian women, you know um, African American people in general. It's it's if it exists, it is out there. It's it's like Rule 34 for marketing. If you can think it up, um, and you know, chances are if you had the wherewithal. To, to relate it to something else, then it probably exists, and that there's a way to link to it, and that if you're, you know, if you're in, in, in charge of any sort of marketing effort, that these are things that are always going to be on your mind, you know. But in general, um, you know, working with targeting specific demographics, specifically multicultural demographics, is takes a little extra effort, and I think that that's really what the article is about, was that you can't just create a one-size-fits-all marketing plan, that you really have to integrate. Um, you know, the intricacies and the nuances of what it really takes to relate to people of a different culture than yours. You know, and that's basically what the article is about. 
Yeah, I think that that's a good point um, to do with anything. You know, you can't just have one target audience. You can't expect that all, you, you know, that you're just going to go after one demographic. You've got to take everyone in consideration. So that's basically what the, what they're going they're going after right? after, right, Victor? Yeah, I mean, basically, it's you know, it, if you have a product and you want as many people as possible to use your product, buy your product, uh, you know, take advantage of your service. Um, then you have to do your homework in terms of really diversifying the different, uh, you know, sub strategies of what it really takes to market your product online. That you can't just create a fun uh, web presence or a great website or a killer Facebook fan page or a dope Twitter account. That it really goes beyond that in terms of really um, snuffing out, you know, where your core audience is, assessing where they are across the board, you know, breaking down uh, mm -hmm. through consumer research and um, direct outreach, you know, where, where the different demographics lie and what's the best way to tackle them. What's the best way, uh, you know, if you're um, a serial company to attract a, a more Latino uh, consumer base, you know, um, what's it really going to take if you're Aero Mexico and you want to attract a more Caucasian demographic? I mean, it's, it's all about, it's all about just being real with the people that are out there um, that, you know, the spending power of these minority groups, which really aren't even minorities anymore. I mean, for instance, in Southern California, you know, the Mexican population or Mexican-American population uh, will be the majority soon enough, you know. And, and I think that the way the tides shift um, and how population kind of ends up panning out is going to affect the way people market their products. That if their mainstream consumer is no longer mainstream, that you're going to find them representing different demographics and different and testing for different uh, feedback schemes across the board. And, you know, companies and marketing companies and individuals in charge of these things are going to have to respond accordingly. That social media isn't just restricted to a one-size-fits-all approach, that you've really got to adapt to the intricacies of your audience at hand. And that, that goes for anyone now. I mean, in anyone in any marketing strategy, you're only going to be as effective as how, um, in, you know, as to how complete a strategy you actually have, you know. Agreed. Um, which will bring us to our guest tonight, uh, who happens to be the social media director for Environmental Graffiti. Thank you, Ritu, for joining us tonight. Hey, thanks for having me. Awesome. Exciting to have you here. Um, yeah, what's exciting is, is environmental graffiti itself. Speaking of demographics, you can create your own demographic if you want to, because with the what's behind the brand new launch of this type of environmental graffiti is the fact that you have um, the ability to create your own content and direct it towards whatever demographic you want. So before we get into environmental graffiti, Ritu, tell us a bit about yourself and how you got involved with social media. Well, actually, uh, in terms of social media, the first thing that I started doing was blogging. That was back in uh, early 2007. And uh, I slowly started getting into dig and um, with uh, help from uh, JD and uh, <clears throat> all the other guys. I mean, all these guys took me under. So, I mean, they helped me out a lot. So, that's how I got started. And so, what social network did you, were you gravitated to first? Was it MySpace? It was Dig. Yep. Awesome. And I mean, I did use uh, MySpace a little, but I mean, the way MySpace was going, I mean, it just it just wasn't for me. So. Yeah. I mean, speaking about captchas, I wanted to cut in there and be like, Ergo, MySpace is the worst place on the face of the earth for captchas. That's and I mean, to get rid of them, you have to put in your cell phone number. But that's that's a different story. So dig dig gravitated towards that sort of work. So besides dig, what other social network did you like to be on? Uh, I do like, I mean, Facebook. I enjoy Facebook a lot lately. I mean, uh, for a while I was really gravitated towards uh, Twitter, but I mean, I find Facebook way more, uh, both in terms of uh, personal reasons or business. I find Facebook much better than what uh, Twitter is. So. Well, if JD was able to hear us, he'd be covering his ears right now, and so would so would Jason, and he can hear us. I'm sure he's covering his ears because you're my new best friend, Ritu. I love Facebook too, and it's my social network. So. Yeah, I mean, I think Facebook is huge, and I mean, you know, like when Facebook makes any changes, I mean, 
I understand, you know, like, but for when, when a platform has 400 million users and if they make a change and if 150 million are going to go away, they still have 250 million. So, I mean, they know that uh, we need them as much as they do, you know. Ex yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so now that we, we've got on the topic of social networks, so environmental graffiti has had major changes here. Um, can you br briefly explain to us um, the changes that have been made? So just quickly go over what environmental graffiti used to be like prior to the change. Sure. I mean, uh, before we, we had the change uh, implemented, environmental graffiti was basically, I mean, it, it was a blog, you know, just like any other blog, but the content was much more solid than most. So before we uh, turned it into a social networking platform, environmental graffiti was a blog. So. So okay, then what what caused um, what caused the change? Why did why did environmental graffiti decide to change over to become like a social network? Well, the reason environmental graffiti changed is uh, ever since uh, Chris, the owner, the founder of environmental graffiti, he started, he was getting uh, requests to write about three thousand or thirty five hundred people. So he eventually decided that it needs to go on a social platform, social media platform route, so he decided to change it to this, and I mean, it works out pretty good. And I think, uh, as far as I know, it is the first environmental site in the world to bridge the gap between uh, social media and pay for journalism. Oh yeah, I mean, it's, it's brilliant, especially for writers out there that are looking for a place to get their name out there. Um, and before I go in from my experience as a user, can you just like quickly explain how the new environmental graffiti works? Sure. I mean, basically what it is, is like I said, it bridges the gap between social media and paid for journalism. So say, for example, if you're on Reddit or Dig, I mean, you're voting articles up, you have the control of what goes on the front page and what doesn't. Well, with uh, environmental graffiti, you have the total control. You create the content, you uh, vote them up, and uh, for every thousand views that you generate, you get paid for it. And to be honest, the the actual payout are pretty pretty good than what's mostly out there. So. Yeah, you know, speaking of that, um, I was reading up on the uh, graffiti index and because I was a little interested in terms of how it works. Um, but it mentioned at some point, once it gets up and running and once you guys are scaling the service to accommodate, you know, any amount of writers and stuff, that you guys will be sharing as much as 80% of uh, any given amount of ad revenue with the authors. Yep, I mean, right now we're starting out with 25%. We yeah, which started, is still uh, good. Yeah. Yep, I mean, we started on... Um, uh, about a month ago, and I think uh, probably within probably five to eight months, we should have it up to 80% because we're just wow. starting to see a lot of activity. So That's great. I, I yeah. think it's, I mean, I, I personally was previously before the change was a huge fan of uh, Chris Ingram and obviously environmental graffiti. Um, but I, I really like what you guys have done with it, just philosophically, you know, going from a static um, you know, he, here's the blog, you know, here's some good content to opening, opening it up as a platform for bloggers who maybe this is their thing. Maybe this type of content is their forte. Maybe they don't really have a, a platform currently or a publication that they're publishing consistently from. This could really give them an opportunity to showcase, uh, obviously, their ability to create great pieces of content and, you know, maybe their ability to even market that content on places such as Dig, Reddit, you know, StumbleUpon. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, you name it. I mean, I think that for for writers who are into the, this piece, this type of content that don't currently like have a home, maybe they're jumping from blog to blog. Uh, this the new environmental graffiti could be a great place for them. And so, uh, you know, yeah. I'm definitely yeah. a big fan. And actually, you know, like when somebody writes an article, it just doesn't get published. It actually goes on into moderation, okay. and the editor make it appealing compared as uh, you know, like what works on Dick. I mean, yeah, what works totally. on Stumble Upon, delicious. So. Oh, no doubt, no doubt, because um, obviously, you know, these social networks have become a huge part about how publishers, you know, position content, you know, how they set it up. I mean, it's it's a big part of the cycle here. Um, so what's so what would you say, though? I mean, I know you guys are kind of leaning towards this UGC kind of quasi author moderator kind of approach. Um, but what really excites you about the new environment of graffiti? Like, what do you look forward to most in terms of how, the new platform? I think the first thing about environmental graffiti is, I mean, the team itself. I mean, it's a very driven team, so it's really fun working with these guys. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about environmental graffiti that I'm really pumped about is I can really see what's happening like the next, uh, next big thing. And the angle towards environment, you know, I mean, it's not like the age old, okay, go green. I mean, do this, do that. I mean, it's not geared towards that. It, it has a very unique angle. 
like yeah. really weird stuff, architectural stuff. So I mean, it it really has something that'll appeal to everybody. No, totally, and that's actually something I really liked about environmental graffiti. It's not just the topical environment news, but it's you know, for instance, I could log on and see like you know, top ten most majestical trees in Africa or something. You know, like there's some interesting, rich media oriented uh, content based offerings and I'm definitely a big fan of that in terms of you know obviously the kind of void and genre that um, environmental graffiti kind of has filled and is continuing uh, to fill uh, as time goes on so no very cool stuff it all sounds really cool yep, it's fun I mean and the thing about you know like we don't uh, even when it comes to environment I mean we do about outdoor sports or something weird that's happening in the nature I mean it all it's all something that really appeals to like every crowd even if they're not very environmentally you know associated with environment or whatever so no totally the the content definitely does a good job of you know appealing to a, a more general web audience that in general just likes interesting stuff like some offbeat stuff like stuff that maybe is linked um, so, you know, like you said, the outdoors or the environment, but it's just genuinely thought provoking, you know? Yep, absolutely. Cool, cool. It's great about it. I mean, it's not, the stories aren't on a time crunch. So it's not like, you know, this is breaking news. So you can write, like you were saying, Victor, you know, these great, like 10 great trees of Africa or whatever it is that you, you love. I mean, you can write, I wrote a story about animals because I love animals. I mean, you can write <laughs> about what you enjoy and love and share your passion within this community and get paid for it. And then on top of that, you guys are also having um, contests every month, correct? Yeah, we're, we're actually, uh, at this moment, we have seven contests lined up, one for each month. I'm sure we're going to have more with our partner, but at this point, we're running a, a contest for, for two people to Galapagos Island, and uh, but we'll have one every month, so. Oh, cool. Basically, they just have to write the article put in their zip code or postal code and basically what whatever whoever has the most traffic driven story wins is that how it's going to work yep i mean whoever brings the most uh, page views to the to the article wins the uh, wins the contest and will be allowed to take somebody with them oh awesome that's cool and we'll have one every yeah. every month I that's what I, that's what I'm, I'm, I mean, it's, it's so new and I was speaking with Chris today and he wanted to tell you all to say hi. Um, and, and he's the, the creator of environmental graffiti, but you know, it's still fairly new. So he wants feedback. He wants you to tell from a user experience, you know, if you're liking the site, what you want changed. So, I mean, he's even getting in on the social aspect and it right now it's, it's this community that's building and, you know, you share your own content, which is what I love is, you know, from a writer perspective, you love to write, get your name out there. You, you, there is no threshold on um, how many views you have to take in. So what they do is they 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 check to see how much you've made at, by the end of each month. So there's no threshold that you have to bring in a certain amount, except um, it gets higher when you get uh, 3000 you or sorry, 1000 you. Um, views and so basically what happens at the end of the month you get calculated and it gets shown and it gets sent to your paypal um and you get paid on the fourth of every month which is which i mean there is a threshold of ten dollars that you have to make prior to it being sent to your paypal but i mean this is a place where not only can you um engage on other social networks such as mix reddit even dig um and share the content as well as on facebook and twitter but you're also within this community of other writers that you can promote their stuff and help them out. So it's definitely a place to check out. I'm enjoying it as a user. Um, again, they're going to be adding new um, information as they go on and would love to have your feedback. So we have on the socialblade.com uh, social slash show blog page a sign up link so if you want to get a part of the community you should get part of it now because you can have your say on what you what you like about it and not and sign up and let's all friend each other i think that's now aaron i have a question it looks like you need an invite uh if you sign up on our page do you get an invite Actually, uh, I just dropped an invite link on on the chat room, so that should give an instant invite. If you sign up from the homepage, it's it'll uh, it'll go through an approval process. But if you work 
the one that's on the chat room is to take you right in. Okay, so we'll make sure that that link is on the uh, the show notes for the show here. So um, socialblade.com slash show will have the link. And the other yeah, thing that so, I wanted to... Yeah, I mean... To... Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. The other thing that I wanted to mention is uh, once you sign in, you'll see a little uh, thing. I think uh, Victor had uh, looked at it. It's called a graffiti index, and the amount that shows, shows on there is the rate that you're getting per thousand views. So, say for example, if somebody does writes a really good article and gets on day gets fifty thousand views, I mean they can make about one hundred fifty to two hundred dollars per article. So it yeah. really works out specifically <laughs> for people that are starting out, you know, in terms of blogging and writing. No, nah, that's great. I mean, I was like I said, I was just briefly looking at how the graffiti index works, and I think there's a lot of upside for people who are into this content that you know maybe can do a great job of creating stuff that fits the mold of what works on 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 environmental graffiti, you know. And I think it's a breakthrough concept. I mean, I couldn't imagine um, what it'd be like for let's say another another site in another genre, let's say even Mashable, like running towards this approach. And the amount of capital that you know maybe shifting between publication and you know author, I think that this really makes a full circle relationship work. That it's a sustainable model, it's an interesting model, um, it's going to draw participants. Obviously, the promotions are going to do a good uh, a good lot to you know to kind of boost that to get people interested. Um, but all in all, just from what I've heard, I mean, it all sounds like kind of a new breed of uh, social website, specifically. Um, you know, the environmental graffiti and how they fundamentally become, you know, the environmental social news site. Like now they are, you know, now they have a community, they've got people creating uh, content, submitting it to the site, being able to make money off of it. I mean, this really, I think, could be a great situation, not just for the publication, but obviously for people who are really interested in engaging and participating uh, within this uh, new social media structure, essentially. Yep, absolutely. And I mean, the other thing about it is, uh, anytime you get the views for, for for your articles, you get you have uh, analytics, you have the dashboard, so you know oh, exactly nice. where the traffic is coming from. That way, everything is transparent. So yeah, no, that's really cool. So there's like a, a dashboard and there's a back end to yeah. it. So if you're an author, you can see exactly how much traffic you brought in. Yeah, exactly and where it's coming from, your refers, oh, oh, everything. Oh. oh, nice. So how long did this take to develop? I mean, how long did it take for you guys to create? Uh, the new environmental graffiti. Actually, uh, even uh, before I got on board the team, uh, Chris had phoned me the back end. So for, for it to come uh, completely be done, I think it took about one and a half, two years. Wow. So, but this still, though, it's an amazing it, thing. This was his initial idea. I mean, he never, uh, as when I was talking to him, he said it never was, he never planned to make it a blog, but he wanted to scale it up in terms of traffic and get the interest going uh -huh. before. Oh. The community aspect into it. So. Cool. Now, do you think this is something other publications are going to take note of and, and maybe implement in their own way? I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> you hope not. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, I mean, I mean, imagine. I mean, let's let's say environmental graffiti progresses and you know something that people take note and they notice what's going on with environmental graffiti. And they're like, oh, I want to do the same thing. I mean, you don't think that this is something that, you know, from a model perspective of, you know, how to run a publication, how to open it up uh, to submissions and, you know, creating a, a really interesting social news community. I mean, this seems like something that I think could work with other publications as well, you know? Absolutely. And I, I think it's a very sustainable business model, too, because... You know, a, a lot of, say, for example, dig. I mean, you do things, but I mean, you're really not getting much. I mean, getting much anything back. So, it, like you said earlier, Vic. Uh, say, for example, if Massable did that with social media stories, I mean, it really is something that can sustain in the long run. Mm. No, totally, totally. Especially if um, if you set it up right. I mean, if if you can if you can find a way to you know cover all your overhead, server costs, you know, development costs onboard editors, you know, people like you who are working on part of the team, but at the same time have some left over or create a way to, to you know, um, have a, a segment of that that's kind of set aside for the authors and the people who are creating this content. I mean, that's great because, you know, I've seen a lot of other sites who kind of have done something similar, but they don't really address the money aspect. They let you, you know, create content that can be published, but, you know, they don't really share any of the uh, benefits 
uh, from a monetization perspective with those authors that there are some publications that you know maybe really do a great job of creating an interesting uh, user generated content team but there's no there's no compensation there's no there, it's all give no take you know from the um, yep, exactly. from the author's perspective and I think this is a way to get people interested that maybe there's people who are sitting on the fence uh, maybe they think oh well I can come up with the next, you know, quarter million uh, page viewed um, environmental graffiti article. You know, this is a way for them to either put up or shut up. It's like they can publish it, get, submit it. You know, you guys can obviously see if it's up to snuff and if it's up to snuff, see how good it does, you know. And um, I'm interested to see where EG goes from here on, you know, how they develop this, how they tweak it, you know, how it really kind of becomes a, a kind of prototypical example of a way for people to really reach the highest level of engagement between uh, publisher and audience. Yep, absolutely. And well, I mean, that's, that's what I want to know. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to know, you know, what is the future? And I think you were just about to answer that. So go ahead. Oh, I think the future is really bright. <laughs> I, um, I really think, I mean, uh, in terms of writers, we really, say for example, somebody new is just starting to blog or write. I mean, they can't generate money from their blog right away. It's 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 gonna take a while. I mean, we all know about it. So if somebody jumps on uh, environmental graffiti platform right now, we will teach them the you know the ins and outs. So if they write an uh, if they write an article, there is there are editors that will actually moderate and teach them exactly how to go about it so that they can generate those views. So they can make money but still learn and probably go and apply those same uh, same knowledge that they get from their uh, the environmental graffiti platform to their own blog. And probably hopefully they can generate traffic to their own sites too. Cool. No, that's exciting stuff, man. For a new social network that you want to try out, and even if you're not a writer, Definitely get yourself hooked up on environmental graffiti. That's exactly where you want to be right now. And if you are a writer, there is no doubt that you should be on environmental graffiti because, I mean, what what they're building here and the community that's going to be uh, coming your way and be, you, that you'll be able to be a part of is going to be awesome. So. You'll be able to get more information on our blog. Again, Ritu, thank you so much for joining us on the Social Blade Show tonight. We appreciate having you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate this. Yeah, yeah. You guys are doing yeah, some really exciting you. stuff. And, you know, thanks for thank giving you. us a chance to cover it. Okay, so, uh, you know, you can sign up again on socialblade.com slash show and get to know more about Ritu on Twitter at twitter.com slash Pant. And get to know him because he's a cool guy. Okay, Ergo, take it away. Oh, the <laughs> show, I can't believe it's over already. Yes, it is. Um, we, we actually, before we run, we have uh, a special message. Uh, JD, again, he, he's joining us here, uh, but he can't actually hear us, um, or I think he can see us, but he definitely can't hear or, or talk. However, he did record a video right before he got on the plane. And uh, according to what he's telling us, uh, to get this video, um, the. <laughs> Uh, the lady at security cursed him out and uh, threatened to call security. Sorry, the, the lady at the terminal. Uh, so here, without any further ado, is just a quick video JD made for us. Hey guys, JD Rucker here, uh, reporting from Detroit. I wish I could say that it was a social media event, but unfortunately it wasn't. Uh, today's show is brought to you by Delta, and. Uh, Hope that everything goes well. Ritu, thank you for being on the show with us. And uh, to the Social Blade crew, the Social Blade audience, and our wonderful guest, Dave Altavilla, thank you very much. And look at this technology. Look at that. See? You didn't even hear that. That's that's the, the, the maglev train here in the, the Detroit Detroit airport. So, uh, so uh, see you guys next week. So thank you very much for that, JD. Um, also, uh, thank you again, Ritu, for joining us here. Uh, you were great. Um, thank you to our audience. And for anyone that isn't already following us, don't forget we have our profiles across many social networks. If you go to youtube.com slash social blade, don't forget to subscribe there. And uh, we'll leave you a comment on your channel also to show that we do interact with you. Uh, Twitter.com slash social blade and the new Facebook um, Aaron, what, what is it called now? It's not a fan page. It's just, what is it? 
We are we we have an official fan page. It is a fan. It page, is a fan page, but still? it's called an official page. It, but you can't be a fan of us anymore. Well, you have to like us. It, yeah, you can <laughs> like us. To so come and like us. And again, I wanted to say this before before we cut it off. Um, thank you for spending Earth Day with us and talking about environmental graffiti. That's right. Um, so, yeah, thanks for spending your time with us, too, and to the audience as well. Okay, Erica. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so in your uh, exuberance there, you didn't actually tell the people. It's facebook.com slash socialblade also. Just to throw that out there. So again, yes, thanks everyone. And uh, lastly, just thanks to our sponsor, Dave from hothardware.com. And uh, for everyone else, check back socialblade.com slash show next Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific, whatever time it is in your time zone. And remember, we are Social Blade.